I mean, I know you. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, summarise that. So, so saying this is one of a series that I've done over the years, uh, reviewing and looking forward to what uh, uh, might might be happening this year. Um, I've changed the format a bit this year, so uh, I hope that will be satisfactory for everyone. Some of it will look very much the same. Some of it might look a bit different, but let's let's see what happens. Okay, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, as ever, is based upon the uh, report that we put out uh, at the beginning of the year. We always try and get it out by February, so it's well in time for the new uh, butterfly season. And so you're well informed as to what has happened um, in prior years. And so I'm sure most of you are going to be familiar with this cover. So let's just have a look, uh, as I traditionally do, at the numbers and where they all come from, because this is quite important in terms of... Of, of the way people are recording, and I'll be coming back to this in a, a little bit, bit later in the talk. As you can see, um, these numbers may be slightly out of date because there's always some people who are still putting re uh, records on from 23, not to mention earlier years, which is, I should say, I'm not criticizing that. It's all very welcome. Any data is welcome. So you can see we had uh, well over 72,000 records last year, which is a pretty good total. And about a quarter of those came through the big butterfly count, um, the three year, sorry, three week count that's done in the summer, uh, the big citizen science project that butterfly conservation runs. And then increasingly, we're getting records that come through uh, iRecord, and I'll be talking a bit more about that later. But as you can see, that also supplies a considerable number of records. Uh, then we have records off the transects. And again, I'll be saying a bit more about those in a few minutes. Um, some records come from the BTO Garden Bird Watch, which is a scheme that British Trust for Ornithology run, mainly for counting birds in your garden. But you are also invited to record other types of organism. And quite a few people do record, record butterflies. And then when I say casual records, these are records that typically are reported to me either by people who send me a spreadsheet or sometimes just an email or sometimes a letter. There are still a few people who um, like to put everything down in, in, on paper, and that's absolutely fine as well. And then we have things coming from the branch website, and I'll be talking about a big change this year regarding those records. And then we have a smaller scheme, the widest countryside butterfly survey records, and that makes the 72,697. Um, and as you can see, a large number of people are recording, 3,554, which is a significant level of engagement. We're very lucky to have so many people who are willing to look, look out for butterflies and then send their records in. Um, and I, I heartily recommend that anyone who does see something, even if it seems to be the most trivial thing, the most common thing, still want to know about it. It all it all builds up to the picture and I will never ever reject a record um, provide, provided it checks out, right? If someone reports um, half a dozen Malaysian bird wing butterflies flying around their garden, I might question it. But apart from that, I'm very happy to receive records of any kind. So, where are our records made? Well, as you may be aware, we have a five year recording span, a bit like the old Communist Party's five year plans. And last year represented the fourth year of uh, the, the, current, the current setup. And you can see from all the pretty colors on the map that um, the number of species that were recorded in each two kilometer square. Two kilometer squares called tetrads um, and they are based on the grid squares of the Ordnance Survey. And our aim is always to get as, as a sufficient number of records from each square so that we can draw some good conclusions. It would be great if we could do it for one kilometre squares, but there are four times as many as them, and there are about 662 K squares. So we talk about 2,500, and some of those squares, one kilometre squares, would actually be pretty inaccessible because they'd be in the middle of RAF bases or on the runways of Heathrow Airport, where with the best will in the world, uh, people are not going to go and record. 
but you can see um, the red, the red of the dot, the hotter the uh, square is. So you can see there are some areas that are very well recorded, and you can pick out real hot spots. Um, as you can see, there's quite a chunk of southeast Hertfordshire it has a lot of dark colours, and that encompasses areas like uh, Bulls, Bulls Wood, uh, the Broxbourne Woods complex, areas around Ware and Hartford. Uh, where coincidentally it just happens that Liz and I do a lot of recording and many other people as well. At the top there, the red dots are Thurfield Heath around Royston, the renowned um, butterfly watching site in Hertfordshire. The red dot further west from there and slightly south is represents Hexton Chalk Pit, another great site. And the very dark dot further down from that and on the left is Albury Noah's which again is a very well-known Chalkland butterfly site. And you can see that Chalkland areas are important for butterflies. And the little concentration of red spots, more or less in the center of the map, represents the area around Hartwood Forest, which is rapidly developing into another good area for butterflies. And uh, there are various red spots around Middlesex if we go further south. So we're talking about Greater London. So we're talking about areas like around Rye Slip. Um, Alexandra Palace is now very well recorded. Um, Borsenden Hill in Ealing is a couple more red spots. And then some of the areas around um, to the south, to the, sorry, I beg your pardon, to the east of Heathrow Airport and going down towards the River Thames are also well recorded. So the smaller the dot and the paler the color, the less well it's recorded. And hopefully having the map next to it, it's very difficult to superimpose maps on each other and make them at all legible. But hopefully the map next to it gives you some idea of where the dots are because it should be at more or less the same scale. It's based on the same, um, same output so you can see where the towns are. And then this is the opposite one. And this is quite important because this shows, just picks out the areas of deficit, if you like, um, the very dark areas are ones where nothing has been recorded, but I'm not too worried about those because, as you can see, they are all around the edge of the county, and many of those represent tetrads where there might only be a tiny corner actually within Hertfordshire, and the rest of the square is in Essex or Cambridgeshire or Buckinghamshire or Bedfordshire. Um, and so most of the recording won't be done covering our county, so ignore those. But the other areas are the areas of deficit with fewer than three or fewer than 10 species. And um, you can see there aren't many of those left now. The good news is that after last year, there is no tetrad which hasn't had at least one visit in this, the last four years and hasn't recorded at least one species of butterfly, um, which is good news. So our coverage is getting better and better. Um, so you can see where, hopefully by comparing the left and the right hand maps, you can see where we do have some areas of deficit. And there are obviously areas that you might want to go into and have a look if any of them look close to you. Um, I did quite a lot of this last year, going into areas that were completely blank. And in most cases, it was pretty easy on one day's visit in uh, June or July to soon add somewhere between eight and a dozen butterflies just by a casual walk along some public footpaths or even along minor roads through those squares. So even in the worst areas like the East Hearts Arable Desert, uh, which a lot of people don't like visiting, as you can see by the number of uh, relatively large number of dots in that area, there are usually things to be seen. There are usually um, field edges and field corners which have been not been um, intensively farmed. There will be still be a few hedgerows in some of those places and more hedgerows are being planted over a lot of Hertfordshire these days. Um, and just going south into London, which is the area below the Wiggly line, half, roughly halfway down the map, you can see that the London area is very well recorded. But there's only one square where there aren't many recorded. And I think, if I remember rightly, that's probably because most of that square is within the boundaries of Heathrow Airport. So I appreciate not very easy to go and do a casual um, recording a session there.
So we talk, I talked about the five year recording periods and what I'm going to do now is just say a little bit about some of the maps we're going to be looking at, some of the species we're going to be looking at rather. I'm not re reproducing lots of maps. They are all in the annual report. Um, but I just want to go into a little bit more detail about what we're actually recording. And we have um, three things I think I'd like to point out in each five year recording period. Distribution is dots on the map and every record contributes that. So it's basically a species seen in a particular place, um, in this case, in particular places within a two kilometer square. So any record is useful for that. Um, and that just tells us how widespread the butterfly is. Now, abundance is how many are measured specifically on transect walks. The reason for that is that transect walks, of which we have about 82, 83 across uh, our area, are walked using a standard methodology, and many of them have been walked over many years. And they give you a good comparison um, year to year of the actual abundance of a species in a particular place. If we just looked at abundance across the whole of the area, it wouldn't necessarily be terribly um, accurate because we someone someone new could come in and be recording lots and lots of butterflies in an area that was previously empty. There might be um, all sorts of factors that could affect the abundance. This is a standard way of, of measuring abundance. And this is a scientifically proven uh, system of doing this. So even if a large, some transects aren't walked every year, haven't been walked every year, as long as they've been well covered, that doesn't matter too much because when you've got 80 together, you have got a, a sufficient body of well well recorded information to be able to make comparisons. And on comparisons, as you see it, they are not year to year, they're against a prior five year period. And that again, is to even out the information that we have. So you could get a good year and a bad year, which might just be due to uh, the weather, for instance, or um, as it was earlier this, this, this five year period, due to COVID, uh, meaning more people were going out, but not necessarily being able to do um, the same the same breadth of recording over, over a big area. So by comparing to a prior five year period, it helps to give a more accurate trend as to what is going on. And that's why the data in the report is all the percentages are done against 2015 to 2019 data, not just last year's data. Um, you'll see some reports um, put out or some press releases put out which just say, oh, this year is better than last year, which is fine. Um, but it's comparing um, two relatively small data sets um, compared to looking over a whole five year period. And it doesn't give a chance for variation to be averaged out. And I think that is quite important when we're actually trying to look at tr comparisons and trends. So what I've done is taken the five best increases in distribution and the five best increases in abundance. And then we're going to have a look at the five worst of each of those to see to see what they might tell us about what's happening with butterflies in our area. Now, one of the things to be aware of is that you're going to get much more variability in numbers and percentages if you only have a small number of sites or sightings because it doesn't need many more or many, many fewer to make that percentage bounce up and down. So we must bear that in mind. So this is a small blue and this one, the distribution up because it's up 150%. And this is a case in point. This is a butterfly which isn't well distributed with kidney vetch being its uh, sole food plant and kidney vetch being very much associated with chalky areas and areas not only that are chalky, but are also very poor soil and where the kidney vetch, which is quite a, a particular plant about where it will grow, even if the soil type is right, the, the, there's a fairly small number of sites. But having said that, um, a lot of farmers are now planting kidney vetch um, in mixes to go around the edge of fields. And we are lucky that uh, particularly Liz and I have got a lot of permission to go onto a lot of farmland in North Hertfordshire in chalk areas. And so a lot of this increase and that is probably due 
to observer activity as well as um, an expansion in distribution. Though I think probably with this planting that I mentioned, there is actually a genuine increase in distribution. And we, we hope to see that happening. But this has gone from a species which in 2003 was, well, we wouldn't declare something extinct, but we certainly declare it absent from the county um, and is now relatively well distributed in those chalky areas where kidney vetch grows. And we've seen it expand along corridors like the uh, Bulldog Bypass to new sites. And as I say, expanding as more farmers plant kidney vetch. And of course, the more that plant kidney vetch, the more you get a corridor of kidney vetch across the landscape, which enables uh, this butterfly to expand even more. So the next one that's distributed up is much more common butterfly, the small copper, and that's distributed up 72%. Um, and again, don't forget this is against 2015, 19, rather than necessarily against the last one. Well, definitely not against just the previous year. The small copper tends to be quite variable in its distribution. It has good years and bad years. Um, but I think last, last year certainly showed it up well against the historic figure. And certainly several people have mentioned to me who were not necessarily experienced butterfly watchers that they'd seen um, quite a few small coppers seem to be more, more, more of them around than the, they had previously encountered. So that's good news. Um, quite why uh, that had happened, I don't know. We were concerned that a lot of numbers would go down this year simply because if you remember in 2022, we had that uh, really hot, dry summer, which um, didn't have a great effect on a lot of food plants for, for larval development. Um, and also may have um, caused a lot of problems with uh, nectar plants dying off or frizzling up more quickly than, than they might otherwise have done. But quite a few species do seem to have actually benefited or at least not been affected by that very hot weather. And I think the small copper is one of them. It's, I wouldn't like to predict what it will do this year. It could be good, it could be bad. We shall see. So. Going down, this is one, the Red Admiral. This is the one that made the national news. Um, it was heavily promoted during the big butterfly count. Um, there was quite a lot of media reports about it in the newspapers. I was certainly uh, invited to talk to Three Counties Radio about it on the back of that. Um, and the Red Admiral is always a, a pretty common butterfly. And it's... Uh, it mainly comes here still as a migrant from Europe, though increasingly we are getting uh, records of them all through the winter of ones that have overwintered and um, can appear in mild periods all the way through from sort of December, January and February by, and in, into early March. Because the continental ones don't usually arrive here until late spring. Um, but I think the reason the distribution was up by 55% was due to migration in this, in the particular um, case of this species. I think most people were lucky enough to see it. It's, it was pretty well everywhere. I don't think we've ever had such a great distribution um, of this butterfly as, uh, or at least recorded distribution of this butterfly as we did uh, last year. But uh, who knows what will happen? Um, there's been quite a few record records uh, during January and February of it uh, this year, though nothing exceptional, I wouldn't have said, from the records that I've seen so far. So a lot depends on what the weather in Europe is like and how it's what its breeding success in, in Europe is like. We may have another bumpy year. We may have an ordinary year. Uh, it will be interesting to see. One of the things that... Um, was interesting was although we had a lot here in July and you'd think and I remember predicting that we'd have an absolutely bumper uh, autumn emergence of them when they can generally be seen flying around um, nect late nectar sources like uh, ivy during um, September and October and you know you can see dozens and dozens on large patches of flowering ivy that didn't really materialize there was certainly more about in the autumn than there has been in the last few years but not the mega amounts that I was hoping would be there. So whether that meant they didn't have a particularly good uh, degree of breeding success in this country, 
which may have been due to having got here and then found that the weather wasn't that brilliant during a lot of the summer. Who knows? And I think the small heath is really in the same category as the small copper. It's a butterfly which is actually considered on the, the official listings to be of concern, though in our area, most of the last few years, it has been quite common. And so as you can see, the distribution is well up over that 2015 to 2019 era. And it may well be that it is established more than a foothold in our area, but has uh, managed to adapt to whatever conditions uh, the weather and climate is throwing at it. And it now seems to be very common in any grassland area. Um, but uh, we, we shall see what happens to it. But that was obviously a very good start uh, going up 55%. And again, like the small copper, this is a butterfly that is uh, all over the place. So this isn't necessarily observer, uh, just more people observing, I should say. This is probably a, a, a genuine big increase in its distribution. The peacock, um, we saw a, a big increase in uh, the distribution of this up 46%. It's always a pretty common butterfly um, and quite why it did so well, I don't know. Um, it, uh, as you know, it, it, it hibernates over the winter as an adult, then it's seen in the spring and uh, not when, once you get into July, the spring brood has died off, but the summer brood has emerged and uh, both broods were quite well seen uh, this year. And certainly it seems to be doing pretty well, it seems to be adapting. Um, I think one of the things about the peacock is that most of them go into hibernation very early in the year and are then extremely reluctant to emerge. And it may well be that, that this is a, a good strategy for avoiding the worst of the weather, because probably by early August, 90% of them are already in hibernation. It doesn't matter what sort of later August, September we have, not many are seen. Though, as in previous years, there is some evidence of ones being seen in um, late September, and whether it's it's debatable whether they are a few that have emerged or they are a very, very partial extra brood. But there have been records over the years of caterpillars feeding up during the late summer. And it may be that this butterfly is attempting to have an extra brood, uh, which may or may not be beneficial to it, because whether the extra brood are then able to go into hibernation, uh, we can't say if they do, man if they would be able to go into hibernation, probably all well and good. But if they don't go into hibernation or if they can't feed sufficiently before that, that may be a problem. And uh, this is something akin, but not exactly like we think is caused the, uh, the drop in the wool butterfly. So abundance up. So this is, remember, abundance is butterflies seen on uh, our transect walks and recorded in the standard way. So the abundance of the Red Admiral, I've already mentioned it under the distribution. Not surprisingly, the abundance was also way up. And I mean, 400% is absolutely a huge increase. They were everywhere to be seen. Holly Blue, this was interesting. Um, Holly Blue had a brilliant year uh, last year um, in terms of its abundance. It was really was quite a ubiquitous butterfly. Um, Distribution hasn't changed much, and it is still more widely distributed in uh, the greater London area than it is in the countryside areas, probably because holly and ivy uh, are very common in parks, churchyards, even gardens, waste ground, whereas um, in some parts of Hertfordshire, holly and ivy aren't particularly common where there are large agricultural fields. Um, and that, that may explain why it is really our most metropolitan of butterflies. But there's no doubt that where it was seen, and it is seen very, was seen very widely, its abundance was way up. Whether this is the peak of its um, cycle, which all the literature talks about cycle of abundance, of rise to, in abundance and then drop in abundance, as there is an associated parasite, which... Um, keeps its population under control. 
my feeling is, and I've not really done any real research on this, but my feeling is that that relationship may be weaker than it used to be because most years now seem to be pretty good for the holly blue rather than just occasional years. But it's a delightful little butterfly, very easy to see and record. And let's hope that uh, we see lots in the coming year. The gatekeeper, a bit like the swole heath and the swole copper, um, very well known butterfly, and its abundance was well up. Um, perhaps a bit of a surprise given the dry summer of 2022, as I mentioned under some other species, but it doesn't seem to have um, stopped the caterpillars feeding up, the eggs being laid and cat butterflies waiting, caterpillars feeding up on, uh, on grasses. So uh, that, that was good to see. Um, one of, one of our common grassland butterflies doing well. And this was good. This is the Essex skipper. Now, for years I've been we've been talking about how the swole and the Essex skipper have not been doing well. Their distribution has been going down and their abundance at, the, at where they are found has been going down. So to get a 50% increase over the longer term uh, for the Essex skipper was certainly welcome news. What it means in the longer term, I think it's very difficult to say. Um, maybe it's because people are getting better at um, identifying the uh, the Essex skipper. Um, get, you know, the, the difference between it and the small skipper is perhaps being better known. People are spending more time actually looking at them closely and being able to record them, which would be great. But so there might be a, a, an observer issue there. But uh, who knows? It's very difficult to tell that sort of thing. And then the brimstone, its abundance was well up as well. The brimstone is usually a pretty consistent butterfly. It doesn't vary much from year to year. Um, and it's a 47% increase in, in abundance is pretty good. Um, quite why, again, we don't know. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that shape, whether it's just a one-off change for something in the weather that really suited it. Um, and one of the things we don't do with... Um, the butterflies over winter and the ones that find the summer is actually, this will take a bit of work, but it could be done, is create an abundance index for each brood and see if there is much variation on that. There are so many things that we could do if we had only had the time and resource to actually do the research. Okay, that's, so that's the good news. Here's the bad news. So these are the losers in distribution. And this is the White Admiral. Uh, woodland butterfly, very much a woodland butterfly, restricted to large woodlands with quite large amounts of um, honeysuckle growing in them. This is of more than just local concern. There's concern over a lot of its range that it seems to be, to be dropping. As you can see, a distribution down by 50% means that it is now, or certainly last year, confined mainly to its real heartland woods. Uh, around Broxbourne Woods, Bulls Wood, uh, Brickett Wood, um, um, and, one, and one or two other woodlands. So it's mainly found along the north, the South Hertfordshire, and just into uh, North Middlesex around uh, Rye Slip. The one area where there was an increase in numbers, but unfortunately this isn't covered by um, covered by transects, so we can't really put a, a figure on it. Um, but it certainly seems to be recorded more in the Whippendale Woods area to the west of Watford. So that is some good news. But this is a butterfly which we are very concerned about. Places where you might see double figures of them, you're only seeing single figures. So that's obviously an abundance rather than distribution. But the number of woodlands where it's seen is quite small now. So very worrying for such a magnificent butterfly. The dark green fritillary is a butterfly which is again traditionally confined to chalky areas, um, but it wanders and it has been seen over quite a number of uh, places outside those chalky areas over the last few years. But last year, it was very much confined just to what I call the core sites along the borders. So places like Albury Noah's, Hexton Chalk Pit, um, Thurfield Heath, and then the one colony in central Hertfordshire uh, near Bennington and above the uh, the Bean Valley. So this may not be significant. It may just be that it wasn't wandering as much um, as it does in some other years. 
So uh, that could be weather related. So um, not necessarily something to get too worried about because sometimes these wandering ones are just literally wandering and don't don't actually reflect a real extension in range. So, but we'll see about that. The white letter hair streaks distribution was down. Now, I repeatedly say that the white letter hair streak isn't as rare as people make out. Elm trees aren't as rare as people think. So why is the distribution down for the white letter hair streak? And I think some of this is down to two factors. One um, is that it tends only to come down low to flowers like these thistles if there is a lack of honeydew uh, for it to feed on higher up on trees. And it may be that that didn't happen in the last year um, during its flight season, because June was actually pretty warm. So there may well have been a lot of aphids around and quite a lot of honeydew for them to feed on higher up. The other thing is that there is, as I mentioned, people tend not to expect to see it because it's supposedly a rare butterfly. But if you do stare up at elm trees, we we were doing a survey at a site which hadn't had them recorded for years, and there were some elm trees there, and it didn't take much looking up into the sky to see the little dark shapes clashing above the elm trees. And this is the time to go out now and look for elm trees because they're finished flowering, but they're covered with great bunches of green disc-like seeds. And if you see a tree like that or a hedgerow with trees in that have got those seeds, that's the place to go back to because the larvae, all being well, will be eating those seeds and will emerge as adults during June and July. And for instance, I was walking around my local suburb of Bengio and I've lived here for 30 years. And I found a really mature elm tree that I must have walked past so many times. But this time, for some reason, I looked up and there it was, a, a sort of 40 foot elm tree covered in seeds. So I'll certainly be going back there later in the year to see if uh, the white letter hair streak is around there. All right, the small tortoise shell, um, its distribution was down 18%. This is usually, a, you know, is a very widely distributed butterfly. It feeds on stinging, its caterpillars feed on stinging nettles, and it's a frequent visitor to lots of flowers, both in the countryside and in gardens. Um, but the distribution was way down. Um, this seems to be particularly the case in Greater London, which is interesting, perhaps more so than Hertfordshire. And I'll be coming back to uh, the small tortoiseshell when we look at the abundance as well. So I talked about how the Essex skipper had seemed to do well, uh, better this year, but the large skipper, which has generally been the one of the three golden skippers whose um, distribution doesn't change a great deal. It was actually down a little bit, but only 8%. So uh, perhaps nothing much to be worried about at the moment. But uh, we do we, you know, obviously keep an eye out for it. It's very easy to tell from the other golden skippers. It's noticeably larger than them, though it's not a large butterfly. And there's much more pattern on the wings. And it's much less of a frenetic butterfly, more of a sit around and see what's going on type of species. Right, so we go to the abundance that's down, and this is the one I mentioned, uh, small tortoise shell, abundance was down 76%, which is a huge drop. So it means not only, and this is quite unusual, not only is it less distributed in 2023, but where they were seen, the numbers were really low. Um, and unfortunately, looking at the reports for butterflies in 2024, because as I'm sure most of you are aware, this is one that um, hibernates as an adult. There have been very few reports of small tortoise shells compared to peacocks, commas, red admirals. Um, and this is worrying because it means, not surprisingly, not many were around to go into hibernation. And so not many are emerging now. And of course, what we don't want to see is a downward spiral where because there aren't many around the breeding, there aren't that many pairs to, to uh, lay eggs and um, bring more caterpillars and more butterflies into the world. It's um, the reasons are not clear. For uh, there were in, earlier in the decade, sorry, earlier in the um, millennium, there was a lot of concern over a parasite called Sturmia bella, which seemed to be had come in from Europe and seemed to be affecting them. They seemed to recover from that, and indeed, 
the recovery was slightly quicker in our area around London than it was in many other areas. But last year was pretty catastrophic for the small tortoiseshell um, for reasons that I'm not clear about because stinging nettles are not a rare plant. Um, they don't tend to be terribly badly affected by drought. They're deep rooted. They have um, very tough leaves. So it's a bit worrying as to what's going on with this once ubiquitous garden butterfly. So it will be very interesting for people to record, uh, record this species. Dark green fritillary uh, already mentioned under distribution, but its uh, abundance was also down um, at the sites where it was found, um, where there are transects. Now, the caveat is there aren't that many transects on its site. So Albury Noahs and the ones at Thurfield Heath. Um, so it's uh, difficult to be sure whether that abundance going down by that amount is that important or not. But it's certainly not a good sign. And, and if you combine it perhaps with the distribution retreat, it does mean perhaps something is happening with the dark green fritillary. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see what happens. This is worrying. The grizzled skipper is very confined in our area and indeed across a lot of a lot of Britain. In our area, it's confined really to Albury Noahs and the Bean Valley leading up um, from north of Hartford up to about Watnut Stone. And at many of the sites, it was seen in really small numbers, just handfuls. I don't think there were many double figured counts anywhere. And that includes when you go out and look for roosting ones where it is easier to count large numbers um, on a dull morning when they're sitting on the heads of St. John's Wort rather than flying around as they do quite, quite um, quite busily in, in sunshine. Now, there wasn't a lot of sunshine necessarily for them to be flying around in. Um, and it does look as if something happened in 2022, which prevented them coming out in uh, good numbers in 2023. That may be weather related. It may also be environmental. Um, some of the sites, unfortunately, are not being looked after as well as they might be. Um, and we are working with a lot of landowners of quarries and estates and the Wildlife Trust um, to try and maintain, you know, keep not only maintaining habitat, but improving habitat. But it's quite a particular little butterfly um, and its food plants. I mean, wild strawberry isn't well distributed. And uh, although other ones like creeping sangfoil and um, agrimony are well distributed, um, it's there are other conditions that have to be met, such as bare ground, and that is something that uh, is perhaps in the biggest decline is the bare ground, which gives them the warm ground conditions in which that they can breed successfully. The ringlet was down. Now, this is a very common butterfly, likes damp grassland, and uh, it may be that its abundance was affected by the dry weather in 2022. Uh, because obviously damp grassland was at a premium at the by the end of the summer in 2022. So we have to keep an eye on this uh, and, and see what happens, because last year there was plenty of damp grassland. So whether it would have had good breeding success uh, in 2023 is, is quite a big possibility. But so we'll see. And the brown argus was also well down um, for reasons that... Uh, it's, I'm not entirely certain about, I'll be quite honest, I'm not certain why the abundance went down so much compared to that 2015-19 um, period, because it was certainly a well-distributed butterfly, even if this distribution didn't go up spectacularly, because it certainly got better distributed over recent years. So um, one of the things <clears throat> I hope you can tell is I keep saying, oh, we'll have to see what happens, and I'm, oh, we need to do more research. And this is one of the things Although butterflies are some of the best recorded and best researched organisms in the British countryside, certainly invertebrate organisms, there's just so much we don't know. And so every observation does help us to perhaps get to a greater understanding. So some, I want to say some things about uh, recording butterflies. You will have noticed that we have a new version of the website and 
one of the things that this means is that the news pages have changed and like a lot of other branches who use this same template that we are now using there is no facility to add records which go onto without a heck of a lot of work which go onto the website um, to our databases which is why i've put this will not be added to the database across here so reporting something is great we like to see news but please make sure that you do record your butterflies by one of the many other methods which um, I outlined at the beginning of this talk um, and I will talk a bit more about in a moment. There are lots of ways to do this. There are the app based ones like iNaturalist, iRecord and iRecord Butterflies and also Butterflies for the New Millennium Online. Now I see all the record, I'll talk about the Garden Butterfly Survey separately in a moment. I see records from all of those. They all come through to me as what's called a verifier in iRecord. And I either verify them, which you say, yeah, I believe you, or query them, or occasionally I have to reject them, sometimes because the data that's put in is too vague for the records to be of real use. Um, by preference, I would prefer people to use iRecord or iRecord butterflies. Now, I record butterflies only covers butterflies quite clearly from its name, but I record lets you record absolutely any organism that occurs in this country. So butterflies, masks, wasps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's certainly a way that you can record things like moths that you see during the day when you're perhaps also out looking for butterflies. iNaturalist will also let you do that. <coughs> Um, and iNaturalist encourages you to put photographs in, perhaps more than I record. However, it does allow some very vague records to go through, as well, as well as some very detailed ones. It's actually an American system at its heart, and although quite a few biological recording groups do use it, I would much prefer you to use iRecord or iRecord Butterflies, or if you're not on an app and you're using the web, Butterflies for the New Millennium because these are very much British based um, and make it very difficult for you to put in really vague records. The Garden Butterfly Survey is a long running thing that um, butterfly conservation um, has been running for many years. And uh, that is the records from that are equally useful. And they also go into my view of iRecord. So I can see what, what you're recording in your gardens if you're recording on a regular basis in the garden. So all these are good, but some are actually better than others. But I would, I would encourage you to use these because they make my life easier. Um, and also because I don't then have to, for instance, if someone sends me let, a letter or a, just a note in an email, I have to transcribe that into a spreadsheet. And I have been known to type grid reference is slightly wrong way around to type 22 when it is two or to misspell things quite horrendously. So um, the more it's your writing that you're confident in, the less I have to change it, the more accurate our records should be. So moths, I haven't said much about moths uh, today. There's two, the main reason for that is because unlike butterflies where we get 72,000 records, moths we get hundreds of thousands of records, or at least we get Colin Plant, the county moth recorder, gets hundreds of thousands of records. And that just means it takes much longer to analyze them. So I haven't got uh, an analysis for 2023 in great detail. So that's why I'm really concentrated on the butterfly trends in this talk. But I do want to talk about this because Hearts of Middlesex Moth Group, which is the main uh, vehicle for looking at moths in our area, also launched a new website, um, which again is using a template which is used by many other county uh, moth groups. So if you've seen things like the long running Norfolk and Suffolk moth groups websites, this will look very familiar. And this enables you to submit your records. You can see in the middle there, it says submit your county records the easy way and a button for online recorder. and if you are just submitting a few records, things that maybe you've seen when you've been out and about looking at butterflies, this is the way that I'd recommend you do this. This makes sure that they go straight to Colin and uh, he will be able to review them. 
don't expect to get a lot of feedback because you get so many records unless you're posting something really unusual you probably won't get any feedback on it straight away or directly personally to you if it's unusual you certainly will but what i would urge people to do is to subscribe to a newsletter which colin puts out about every month in um the winter and possibly more frequently it's a fascinating newsletter all sorts of interesting hints and tips and information will help you keep up to date with it it's called um, moth moth mutterings and it's free to receive as an email and you'll be able to subscribe to that if you look at uh, on 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 the website um, there's no charge for it there is actually no formal membership of the moth group um, basically if you get moth mutterings you're considered to be a member of the moth group so just looking at the moth recorder a bit you can, as you see, you can put in records. Um, as there's a, a grid there for you to type stuff in, all the usual, all, as much of the information as you can find. Um, you can put photos in as well. And you can see also, says alternative, we accept records in other formats. And um, there is his list of what he likes to um, get get things through. So you can see. A lot of us who record moths every night in our gardens actually use a spreadsheet because there isn't the time with when you're recording hundreds of moths to put them all in one by one. Um, but there are a number of methods. And if you put your records into iRecord, Colin won't verify them through iRecord. There's just too much for him to do. But what happens is at the end of the year or shortly after the end of the year, he gets sent a spreadsheet which includes all the records that have been submitted to iRecord. Although he's not formally verifying them through iRecord, he will be verifying them through the same system as he verifies the records that we all send in for our, uh, our moth traps. And um, if there are any real big queries, he will contact you then. So um, don't think your records are going into a black hole because you don't hear back from Colin. There's just the volume of stuff and the amount of work that he does for moths. Uh, him being you know, a nationally recognized um, authority on moths in this country and over much of Europe means that he just can't do that. And there's is just a bit more. If you if you just want to put in one record, you can use, as it mentioned, the express recorder. So, for instance, the Jersey Tiger, which lots of people see. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you can you can put in uh, your record in there. And also on the website, I should say, there are lots of photographs, lots of up-to-date maps of where things are across the Hearts of Middlesex area. So uh, that's all I really wanted to say uh, this evening. I just want a, a closing thought that will 2024 be a bumper year for the brown hair streak? And I say that because up to a few years ago, as you're probably aware, the brown hair streak hadn't been recorded in Hertfordshire in Middlesex for many, many years, and it was never a common butterfly, and some of the records were considered to be a bit dodgy. Uh, then it was found in southwest Middlesex and has been spreading across the county. Now, this winter, um, a number of people have been out looking for them. Liz is certainly one of those, and a gentleman called uh, Rohan, who has uh, taken photographs of uh, eggs in many, many different places and also recently a larval photo, which you may well have seen on the website. And so I don't want to steal Liz's thunder because she's going to be talking a lot about this at the uh, Members' Day, but its distribution is now pretty wide across Middlesex, right into um, central areas like Regent's Park, and it has just crept up at last to become an official Hertfordshire butterfly with records around Merry Hill. Uh, near Bushy. So it's really going to be worth, it's too late now probably to look for the eggs because the blackthorn is in full flower. But come late July and through August into early September, it will be worth looking pretty well anywhere to see if you can see this butterfly. It does spend a lot of time high up, but it will come down to flowers, both the males and the females, and they're very distinctive. You can't really mistake them close up for anything else. So it would be great to think that 2024 will be a bumper year for the brown hair streak. Um, because it was so so unrecorded before 2020, I can't produce figures on its abundance and distribution, which mean anything. 
because we're comp comparing to a very small um, number. But come the next uh, recording period, which will start in 2025, uh, we'll be able to do that. And I think that will be very interesting to see how this species is spreading. So thanks very much for listening and watching tonight. And uh, I'll now shut up. OK, thank you, Andrew, very much. I'm going to try and stop recording. And I'm not sure whether I'm going to be very successful. Let's see. Ah, I have paused recording so people can talk as much as they like. Um, I've put on to the in the comments a link to the website page where we've got the poorly distribute, poorly recorded um, tetrads for you. So you can see where to, you can have a look at it in detail um, in the quiet of your own home. Um, I don't know whether anyone's got any questions. If you have, um, let's try and improve my view. Uh, resizing. Right, now, if I got any questions, I haven't had anyone in ask a question yet, but um, has anyone got any questions? Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and call out because I haven't worked out, haven't got my full view yet of um, participants. Uh, yeah. Okay. So have we got any questions for Andrew? Brian. Brian. I, I do. I, I wrote it to you too. It's about butterfly gardening and private guard and people's private garden. Do you, do you have a, a network of these people? I mean, I, I, I've bragged about this before, but my little garden in the middle of Foxborough, Massachusetts, where I live, is the, the number one uh, most abundant species site in Massachusetts. And it's just a little quarter acre plot in the middle of town. And these, these sites can invite a tremendous diversity of butterflies. So I, I know you have garden people that send in but is it sort of a separate section that that uh, you keep track of separately um well as, as i mentioned there is this long-running garden butterfly scheme a uh, recording scheme which a lot of people do contribute to um <clears throat> i think the, the numbers for that got hidden um, in amongst all the i record uh data that i that i put up early on i don't think i pulled those records out separately but there are a lot of people contributing and this is a scheme that's been running for oh i can't remember exactly how long but probably 25 years minimum yeah. and so a lot of people do do contribute that that information and so yeah. there is a lot of garden recording i can't think of anyone who's got a garden which has got um a huge a species list as huge as some of the uh the major countryside sites but there's really no reason why if you're growing a good variety of plants um and you've got a reasonable amount of space it's basic because not everyone has especially in areas like like london yeah, of course of you course. shouldn't be able to get 20 plus uh butterfly species in your garden i think liz you're probably in that category aren't you i've over 20 years i've got 28 species oh, there we go but um, but i haven't had common blue for about 15 so wow. um so, but I have had purple emperors and I have had silver wash fritillary. I had a silver wash fritillary lay an egg on a dead bit of hebe last year or the year before, um, which was a bit of a shock. I wasn't expecting that. But um, in fact, just on the silver, the silver wash fritillary is, is now not uncommonly seen in gardens, especially gardens that got buddlier as they tend to, uh, towards the end of the season, when they tend to wander more widely from their woodland. Uh, habitats right i've got a couple of questions in comments They're actually very similar um kate t says if i'm recording butterflies on the bto garden bird watch should i also record them on i record or would this be double counted and amira says if we submit records for the hearts and middlesex moth database does this automatically reach i record too or do we need to submit it to i record also Okay, uh, dealing with the first one about BTO Garden Bird Watch. Um, no, you don't need to record them on iRecord. Um, we don't have an official feed through from the BTO Garden Bird Watch, 
but I actually asked asked them for a list of all the butterfly records every, at the end of every year, um, which they're quite happy to send me. So I get everything that's recorded it on the Garden Bird Watch anyway. So it won't go into iRecord. Um, so that, but you don't need to put them in there. That would be double counting. So basically, just carry on recording through the BTO Garden Bird Watch. Um, and Amira says, um, no, they don't go into iRecord. Um, but that doesn't matter because. Colin Plant, the, the moth recorder, doesn't actually go into iRecord to verify things. So um, as long as you submit them through that, he will get them. And he will also get the iRecord records, as I mentioned, through um, alternative means. Um, basically, iRecord, as, as, I mean, is some, I know some people regard iRecord as almost the sort of, oh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? As a definitive list of everything that's been seen in an area, but that's not actually the case. Um, I see it more as just an alternative to people who used to send spreadsheets or lists, and it's just easier for them to do it through iRecord. But th things reaching iRecord isn't the be all and end all. I think that's probably the, the easiest way to put it, to say it. Andrew, if you have 72,000 records, I have a privet hedge and there are 20 red admirals on it. Is that 20 records or is that one record of 20 admirals? That's one record of 20 red admirals. Okay, very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Dick has asked for a link to moth mutterings. Yeah, Basically, I can't, I can't find it on their website. Uh, but... the, the thing to do is email Colin directly. Okay, uh, that's fine. I'll do um, it. If you don't get a copy, email him again. He's not brilliant at answering every email he reads them but you've just got to understand this is colin colin is colin yeah. and um yeah understand uh, and also moth mutterings is put up on onto the wet moth group website as well but not always the most recent one straight away yeah i can't find it that's the yeah because obviously it's a new website so yeah, maybe that's yeah you've why. got to find your way around also i should just say that with the new website it does list a lot of sightings. So if people want to know more about where a moth, how many moth records there are, they're all listed. And if you actually pay to have the Cinnabar membership, you get even more information. And uh, it's not it does, it's not very expensive. Uh, it's worth it because I can click on my a square and know how many records there have been. Whereas if you just look at map maps on that website, you just see the, where they are. But by paying that little bit extra you get even more info so it, paying, it's worth paying it. who Liz? Paying um, who? I don't know who actually gets the money it's probably Jim Wheeler who's the um the Cinnabar membership Andrew it's, oh. it's called Cinnabar membership but I expect Jim Wheeler actually okay receives that do you know that Andrew? I don't know for sure but I would imagine either Jim as the person who maintains and um, designed the website or it's a, or a cut of it also goes to Colin. Maybe I don't. I don't know. I have. I'm not I, privy to that. The financial. No, well, I joined the, the. I joined the Norfolk Moth Survey because I like to know what's being recorded there, and I found I was actually a member of Hearts and Middlesex Moth Group as well. I don't know where that's supposed to be the case, but it it worked. Um, hold on. Let's see. I've got another message. I'll I'll answer Brian in a sec. Um. Kate T has a question from my son. Why are black hair streaks so rare when blackthorn is so common? Now, this is black hair streak as opposed to brown. Does he mean black or brown, Kate T? Uh, we're going to get. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, black hair streaks like a very a slightly different type of blackthorn to the ones that the brown hair streets like, so I'm told. Um, and they're just a very, very, very restricted hair streak. Whereas brown hair streak, why, um, the answer to, as to why brown are so still very rare, it's not obvious because where people have introduced them into some areas, they are thriving. Um, they are thriving in Middlesex, whereas they aren't. We always used to think the brown hair streak was going to come in via 
Aylesbury or from the Upper Thames distribution. Whereas in fact, they haven't got very far because there's a lot of very intense farming between here and Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. Whereas for some reason, they love the sort of derelict habitats that are still to be found in Middlesex, the old horse paddocks, which are now green open spaces, which are surrounded with blackthorn and they just seem they're very desperate to lay eggs and they're laying it on all the blackthorn they can find this year but um yeah there's some element of soil types because we know that the clay in hot middlesex that we find more eggs on clay than we do on the gravels and they seem to have followed the m1 route into hertfordshire as opposed to the a1 so um, anyway, Brian, you have another question. I just have to say that I'm so impressed with the English population and their willingness to make these records. In Massachusetts, where I live in Northeastern United States, so many butterflies have almost completely disappeared in the last few years. We have no idea where they've gone. All the satyrium hair streaks have gone poof. I haven't seen one in five years. Um, and 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 nymphalids and swallowtails and mycenids it's incredible the loss of butterflies in the last few years and they have no hint all i want to do is tell everybody in the massachusetts butterfly club to watch a replay of this presentation by andrew tonight oh, thank and you. see if we can change our uh feelings about um being careful about our records because we have so many people that just go to a few standard sites and they're are chasing around after a, a a butterfly list for the year and not doing transects and not doing yard stuff and not making butterfly gardens so so i, I think this will if they watch it this will inspire them and i greatly appreciate all the work that you you've done and your organization's done and your countrymen have done it's 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 truly remarkable i i applaud you from across the ocean thank you very much brian I should, and I, I should i hope you can you know urge you know you, your urgings are successful i, I so. should just say that a lot of the recording goes back uh to the 1995 when the butterflies for the new millennium was launched and our butterfly recorder then was john murray who set up the annual report and Andrew has taken on his legacy. Um, John is just about to retire from our committee. And I think, you know, we, if it wasn't for John initially, I certainly wouldn't be recording butterflies in the way that I did. He got us completely hooked. It was in the days before you had the internet to any great degree. Right. It was all by post. He would send me some maps, say, I want you to go and visit those squares and record speckled wood. I want you to go and find small tortoiseshells in those squares. And I did. And I think we've got to be very grateful for John and his um, sheer enthusiasm um, to get He seemed to have this knack to get people to go out and do it. And Andrew's taken it on now. And mm -hmm. we have got one of the best, I think, recording volunteer units in the country, really, haven't we, Andrew? I think, I think, I think that's true. Yeah, patting ourselves on the back a bit. But yeah, I echo what you said about John. I mean, it was when I moved to Hartford in the mid 90s, went along to a, a weekend meeting and saw his annual report, the first one, no cut, no photos or anything in it. Um, but it, I, I was just grabbed by it. And mm. then I said, said, oh, I think I might do a transect here. He said, well, could you do one there as well, please? Yeah. So I ended up doing the two transects that I do. So, uh, yeah, no, I, yeah. I can only echo that. He is the basis of our modern recording system in um, in Hertfordshire and Middlesex. Yeah, um, we are, hopefully, he's going to turn up at our Members' Day, which, is, again, another reminder, it's on the 6th of April at Greenwood Hall, uh, Greenwood Park in Chiswell Green. We hope to be able to present him with a small gift. I know, I don't think he's watching, so um, it's very unlikely. But, um, yeah, he took on the moth record. <laughs> he took on moth rec the moth recorder role after you swap they swap roles but um are there any more questions oh someone does america have a national scheme like our big butterfly count brian um, i think he's gonna nod his head that way 
We we don't. You know, I, I, I'm proud to say that in 1986, I started the first uh, statewide butterfly atlas project in America. And and I did what your friend did and called people up and <laughs> got them out going. And that lasted through 1991. And, uh, and Massachusetts has the largest butterfly database of any uh, restricted area in North America. And I'm very proud of that, but everything's fallen off the table lately. And, and so uh, I need, um, we need, we need a shot of uh, adrenaline to get everybody looking again, because it's vitally important. And I don't know, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I just don't know how to do it. So um, really, I'm going to ask them to look towards butterfly conservation and and the look inwards, I guess, and see that uh, when all these butterflies disappear, maybe they're out there, maybe they're not out there. Maybe it's the European hornet that's uh, eating them all up. Who knows? But we need to get we need to get some answers. And we don't have a national butterfly scheme. No, we don't. We are a bigger country. <laughs> well, anyway. I know. Um, Massachusetts uh, at 8,600 square miles. So it's big enough. <laughs> There are several people saying thank you, Andrew. Um, I think we have, it's probably time to say good night to everyone. This yeah. is the last Zoom of our the season. Uh, we will no doubt have another programme next winter, starting after Christmas. Um, Surrey Branch tend to do them from this autumn through to April. Um, we just try and... Um, Keep it to a minimum so we don't overload you. Uh, but yeah, we do appreciate everyone that's been coming along this season. Uh, numbers picked up on last year, so we're very grateful. Makes you feel it's worthwhile preparing. And uh, now on Monday, the transect season officially starts. It's on a Monday this year. So if you walk a transect, it's Monday to Sunday this year. And no doubt it will rain on Monday. Um, anyway, I'm going to sign off. Um, I don't know where how the video will work. Um, hopefully it will be up on YouTube in the next 24 hours, 48 hours. And everyone have a lovely Easter. And um, good night to you. Good night. Thank, good night. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.